Good morning. I think it was raining this morning, don't you? Like pretty hard at one point. Um, my prayer today is that God himself will just rain down on us with some fresh power and grace. We need him, don't we? Absolutely. I, I would like, would you, uh, would you be so kind as uh, to uh, repeat after me this prayer? Um, you can keep your eyes open. Just talk to him, okay? It's the Lord's Prayer, remember? And we, we've taken this and we've kind of, sh- um, I, re- I received this really from uh, some movement of the power of the Holy Spirit in uh, the Southern Hemisphere among the churches where they are experiencing um, much renewal, many people coming to Christ, South America, Africa, India, just the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, if God ever once again started doing in the Northern Hemisphere what he's doing in the Southern Hemisphere, would just blow, blow us all away. It's pretty powerful, right? I don't, I don't know if you know that, but that even in, even in Iraq, there, there are so many uh, people finding Jesus Christ and so many new churches being established. You don't pick that up on any sort of news anywhere, but it's actually happening. So, so just open, let's open our hearts. Let's pray this for ourselves and, and for those that, we, that um, are around us, okay? Based on the Lord's Prayer, just repeat after me. I pray that the Father's glory will be revealed to the people where I live. I pray that God's reign, his kingdom reign and authority will be advanced where I live. I pray that God's will may be established in perfect obedience where I live. I pray that the resources of God's kingdom will sustain our needs day by day. I pray for the Lord to be merciful to me in forgiveness and that that I would generously extend that same forgiveness to those who have sinned against me. I pray that God's Spirit would keep my heart and my feet, my eyes and my ears, from places of temptation. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would enable us to resist Satan and that the kingdom of darkness would be voided where I live. Amen? Amen. God's powerful word for us. These kinds of things are are going to happen because we pray. In fact, when the disciples said, teach us how to pray, uh, Jesus taught them basically this, what we know as the Lord's Prayer, that this would happen. Pray this because it's important that you pray this for the kingdom to come, for the will of God to be done, for forgiveness to flow, not only in our own lives, but out to others as well, that the tempter would be completely defeated, right? Darkness would be like voided where we live. And that God's glory, God's kingdom, God's power we all would begin to experience in a fresh way, that we would become the new creation that Jesus died to make possible. So just in the midst of this, just want to remind you that uh, you were made for more. You were made for more. So we have, you know, this time of fasting coming up. I just bless you with complete freedom in our uh, 21-day all-church fast, which you'll find uh, this insert in your program, it's just meant to, it's meant to help you create an environment in your own heart so that you can receive the more that God has for you. It's not to make your life miserable. It's not to say, ah, oh, here we go again. It's to help create space in your life. It's, it's intended to help you slow down, to, to set aside some time, to sanctify some time in your life in order for God just to speak to you in ways that you're not going to hear him if you're just on the run all the time. And if you're just doing all the same stuff all the time, if you're really hungry and you find yourself just increasing in hunger for spiritual breakthrough in your own life, if you're aware of that, then I just invite you into this. And if you don't know really what to do or what it all means, then this little insert can help you. It's intended to help us 
just our own walk with God to experience the kingdom of God in a fresh way, right? And for those around us, I mean, I care about the people around me. And when I see their lives in turmoil and I see things, I, I just see, you know, the enemy, their lives turn into the enemy's playground. When I see their joy and their peace uh, and their love just just robbed, just taken right away from them. It just it concerns, it should concern us all when we see that happening to people. And so the fast is really a good time to start just like just zeroing in, man, and praying big prayers for ourselves, for, for our families, for people around us. Amen. There are things that are going to happen only by prayer. Right? And the things that come out of our praying and catching the Father's heart. And Cheryl was up here, and she talked to you about uh, the whole uh, beautiful event that we have coming up as a part of Partners in Missions, part of Partners in Missions, which uh, begins next Sunday and then the, the following Sunday. Partners in Missions, uh, we have this as a part of that, as our, part of our local part, just uh, this Poverty 101 and, and 201. I just want to say one more thing about this. Um, I, had a, I had quite a surprise yesterday because, uh, uh, as I am uh, fond of doing, I decided to get away early yesterday morning to a coffee shop, imagine that, and uh, sit down and, and do some studying for the message today. But I had no opportunity really to, to work on the message at that time because there was someone I knew. They invited me over to sit with them. They wanted to talk with me. We began to talk about the issue of poverty, homelessness, and all kinds of issues going on. And uh, right toward the end of our, of our time together, because uh, we, we were saying, Lord, how are we going to fund this? Because it's really a big uh, it's really a big deal that, that we're doing this. And you have a registration of $40, which is just like we're just trying to make it possible for you to come, you know, and not charge what, what is needed. So we were just been praying about it. And he didn't even know about my prayer and all. And he just said to me, well, I hear that you're doing this Poverty 101 and 201, and uh, I have a foundation, and we want to grant you $5,000 to get that done. All right? So I just want to tell you, do you think I went away saying, uh, okay, no big deal? No. I walked away saying, whoa, Lord, just like you said, I want this to happen, right? I really want this to happen. Thank you for stepping out in faith for it. And I just, I just, I just share that with you because uh, it, uh, to me, it creates some excitement about what God's going to do for, for all who choose to um, avail themselves of this, uh, of this training, so... Thanks be to God, right? All part of Partners in Missions. Um, excited about what God is doing in us locally and globally. So you're made for more, right? So we're talking about, and this is the, kind of like the concluding message, but hopefully you, God's Spirit would just keep giving you teachings along this line of, of what it means that you indeed were made for more. Not, you were not made for more stuff. <laughs> you were made for more of God, right? You were made for more freedom. You were made for more joy. You were made for more peace. You were, you were made for more effectiveness and fruitfulness in your life. You were, you were, you're made for more. We're, we're made for more than what we're generally experiencing. Uh, that's good to know. I've been on this way with Christ for a long time, and I just feel like I'm in kindergarten. It's just like, are you kidding me? There's just so much here, and he is such an amazing person, this Jesus, who is our Lord. So we're made for more. So there's a better way. We want to shift from, from scarcity to abundance. We, we're trying to, been trying to confront the myth of scarcity. You know, scarcity says this. Scar scarcity says there's just not enough, right? Scarcity is the fear of not enough. Now, we have needs, and there are all kinds of times in which we go, ooh, how's this going to happen? But, um, you know, where are the resources going to come from? Where's the emotional capacity, the love? Where, where, where's the time going to come from? Where, where are the resources going to come from? But this fear, this is, this is the, the myth of scarcity. This is the spirit of scarcity, right? When there's this fear of, of not enough. And we've been, we've been learning that, that we don't have to live under that. We can, we can actually shift from scarcity to abundance. I want to ask you, over these weeks, if you've been coming, has anything been shifting in your life? Because it, if nothing's been shifting, then we need to go, go back, right? Review. Say, God, what do, you, what do you need to shift in me, right? That, that shifting is called transformation, right? We've just, we're, we're shifting into, into the experience of God's abundance. 
And it's, 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 other, it's bigger than, it's different than a lot of times what we think. Scarcity, gripping our hearts through fear of not enough, is the depressing result of a lack of relationship with the God who is love. The God who is love for us. And abundance then is confidence in the generosity of God to us in Jesus Christ. Just confidence. And, and because we have this confidence in the generosity of God coming out of a personal, intimate, and dependent relationship upon God, discovering, you know, we, we sing these songs about, about, about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> Your name makes the darkness tremble, right? It, make, it, 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 it makes the fear wither, right? The name of Jesus, the presence of this person. So we're learning to have confidence in our relationship with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that we can, we can actually live into and live from the security of enough. That Jesus himself is enough. Now I know you got, you got stuff, you got needs, you got to pay bills. I'm not saying don't work. <laughs> Please keep working, just work differently. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not by blood, sweat, and tears sometimes. It is. But you don't have to work anxiously. You don't have to be under the horrible driving yoke of insignificance, unbelief, or fear. You can be free from all of that. Because that freedom comes through your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The point is, is that God's abundance is no myth. Right? Right? His abundance is not a myth. We're not trading one myth for the other, for another. Now, God's abundance may seem like a myth because it's not something we often are experiencing. It may be outside the range of our normal experience. It may not be the primary storyline of our, our, our lives. Our narrative may be one of fear, you know, of a, a kind of a protectionism, kind of a fortressing ourselves, kind of uh, living suspiciously and re in, in a reactionary way to everything around us. It could be very, very much that that's our narrative. That's our storyline. And yet, here comes the gospel of Jesus. Here comes the good news of Christ that changes the narrative and says, Jesus says, I'm here. I have, uh, in me you have life. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full, right? And either he's lying through his teeth or it's just something that we haven't learned yet to tap into. And I, I'm going to take a bold stance here. I kind of think he's not lying. I believe he's telling the truth. And that we can live into that abundant life. And so in order to help us further dismantle the myth of scarcity, let us just look at Philippians chapter 4 verses 4 through 20. And we're going to highlight a few verses this morning out of this passage. All right, Philippians chapter 4. Um, Verse 4, here's this letter from Paul. I just want to, he's, he's kind of an apostle of uh, encouragement. He's, he's, uh, he's, he's an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing a deep encouragement in this letter. This letter is written from prison, so I'd like for you to put it. He's not, he's not in an ivory tower somewhere. He's actually writing, for, he's imprisoned. Do you, have, do you have any idea what we're saying here? He's in prison. He's not writing from where you are in, in, in your life as sitting here. He's imprisoned. The circumstances around him are difficult. Um, he's been like through the, through the fiery trial. And he's writing this, this letter. And he says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things as these. Whatever you have heard, learned, and received from me, or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. 
I rejoice greatly in the Lord at, that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. But I, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, I set out from Macedonia. Not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. What he's saying, for your generosity. I've received full payment and have more than enough. I'm amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are fragrant offering and acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's a pretty good way to end the letter, right? There's a few more verses after that, but that's essentially what this is about. So I'd like for us, to, I, I, was, uh, so I was sitting at a, a, at a luncheon the other day with uh, a man who'd been following Jesus for really a long time, really concerned about the state of the church, state of the country, and all kinds of things. And he just raised a question. He asked me the question, this is, why do you think that, that so many Christians are just living so fearfully, so anxiously, are so mad, are so divisive, are so, you know, unloving. This is what he was experiencing. He says, why do you think that is? Well, I never quite put it this way, but this, uh, this just, as we reflected on it, this phrase came to my mind. And um, it's, it's because it is so easy for us to live, and here's the phrase, right, ungospeled lives. Ungospeled lives. So we're to, live, we're to live gospel lives, right? We're to live lives that are affected by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like the good news. That's what it means, the good news. So we are bearers of the good news. We're participants in, in, in partnership with Paul, with the believers, with, down through the ages, who've experienced in Jesus Christ this incredible good news, right? That our sins are forgiven, that we are reconciled to God, that somebody went to death for us and defeated sin, death, and hell, and overcame the darkness and we have been, and, and was raised from the dead and we've been raised to new life in him by our faith put in Jesus Christ. Grace has flooded into our lives. We are able now to live freely and fearlessly because of the Lord Jesus, what he has done for our lives. And you can just go on and on and on because it's so much that Jesus accomplished for us. To live a gospel life means to live from that premise with that person in view, Jesus. But many of us, we live ungospeled lives. How many times I've lived an ungospeled life? That means I hold, I may hold the truth as, you know, propositional or a doctrine or a concept or an idea, and I agree with that with my mind. But in my life, in my spirit, in the way that I live out things, I live ungospeled. I live as though Jesus never died to forgive my sins and help me forgive the sins of others against me. I, I live as though if darkness gets the last word. I live as though anxiety is the normal way to live and that this driven pace I'm, I'm going at is, is what I must do in order to attain a certain level of of, of feelings of well-being and significance. And if I, can't, if I can't handle life around me, then I medicate myself with media. I med medicate myself with all, all kinds of things, right? Whether it's drugs or pornography or, um, you know, or just like career advancement or all these things. I, here's the thing. I'm, I'm living an ungospeled life. This is a serious issue. But Jesus has come so we would live a gospeled life. Are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? And so he's writing to the believers here in a sense, showing them how to live a gospel life, right? You have met Jesus Christ. You have been 
raised up to life through your faith in him. This is not your own doing. It's not your works. You're saved by grace through faith. And now that this great gift has come cascading into your life, now you are free to live as a new creation and to learn what that means and to find joy in the Lord. And so he says, and again, this helps us move. This helps us shift the focus from scarcity into abundance. He says this, Rejoice in the Lord, and I always, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So here's the gospel life, right? We are rejoicing in the Lord. In the Lord. That means he has our hearts, right? Who has your heart? Who has your heart? If we're to live a gospel life, Jesus has our hearts. Jesus has our eyes. Rejoice in the Lord in the midst of whatever circumstance you are in. You have been given Jesus. The gospel has come to your life. A gospel of grace, not of works. A gospel that is not mere words, but power has come into your life. Therefore, <laughs> rejoice. Paul, this has been known as as the letter of joy. In fact, I, I went through and tried to count them. Rejoice in this, these just four chapters, four, you know, a little tiny letter. Uh, four times the word rejoice is used. Five times the word joy is used. And three times the word glad is used. So it's just kind of like, you know, here. <laughs> the, rejoice in the Lord. Now, here's, here's the thing. Um, if I have my eyes... On everybody else, if I have my eyes on all the circumstances around me, I'm pretty not going to find a reason for rejoicing. Unless things happen to go my way. Unless, unless the wind starts blowing in my favor. Right? And then my joy and peace are all dependent upon my circumstances. But that is really a horrible way to live. But rejoice in the Lord. The Lord. So the whole idea is, is like to fix your gaze upon him. I, as I heard one man years ago say to me, I've never forgotten this. We, we learn to, to gaze at Christ and glance at our circumstances. The problem is that many of us living ungospeled lives, we gaze at all our circumstances. And we only occasionally glance at Jesus. So here's... Here's shifting the focus. Rejoice in the Lord. Now, a lot of times you're not going to know this, and I'm not going to know this until, until, until things get rather bare bones at times, right? Someone has said, and I've quoted many times, Jesus, you don't know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you got. <laughs> because a lot of times, we're, we're happy with Jesus as long as Jesus is also feeding us a lot of other stuff over here, Right? As long as life is going well and things like that, I'm happy with the Lord. As soon as it doesn't go well, and then I'm, so I'm not so happy with the Lord, right? Because the Lord's ultimate object of, of concern should be, should be that I am happy and that people do what I want them to do and circumstances go my way, right? But you know what? We've never been trained as really strong followers of Jesus when everything goes our way. We never learn to truly find Jesus fully sufficient as long as we are um, supplied by all these other things. So in our consumer culture, which trains us to need, 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 need so much other stuff in this consumer culture, many times, even we who are followers of Jesus are actually rejoicing in the Lord only so long as things are going pretty well. But here, Jesus is calling us to something different. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Let your gentleness be made known to all. Message translation says, celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, truly revel in Him. Let your gentleness be known to all. The Lord is near. Do everything, he says in this little letter, without grumbling or arguing. <laughs> Repeat after me. <laughs> Do everything without grumbling or arguing. 
that can be translated without complaining, right? Do everything without complaining. Then it says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, right? It's moving. It's moving from scarcity to abundance. The next thing he shows us is this. It's just in practicing the presence, the practicing the presence of the Lord in life. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's, that's pretty cool, isn't it? I like what the message says, the way it translates it. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Or another translation says this, don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before God, overflowing with gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. In, during this time of fasting, if you don't know what to do, this is a good thing to do. Take all the things that you're worried about and anxious about and turn them into prayers. That would probably take at least five minutes. But do that. Actually do this. This is what we're to do if we want to shift from scarcity to abundance. Three words for prayer are used here. The first just simply means, you know, instead of anxiety, prayer or the prayer, right? It's just like, it's like bringing all of life into conversation with God. It's kind of, it's kind of unselfing your life, looking at Jesus and talking to him about your needs. As one person put it, the only way to get out of the cramped world of ego and into the large world of God without denying or suppressing or mutilating the ego is through prayer. The, the one who will take care of your true self is God who in prayer and to whom in prayer you bring, you bring the heaviness and the load and the concern of your life. Pray. Let your request be made known to God. Or th there's a sense of, of the urgency, right? With prayer and petition. There's like this urgency about it. Um, some of the best praying happens when, you're, when you feel that visceral urgency. Right? It's not like, God, if you don't meet this need, you know, I can put it on credit. If you don't meet this need, I got a way to do it. Right? It's, it's more like, God, like we need a miracle here. It's, it's only by your intervention. This prayer is big enough. It requires you, oh God. I cannot do it on my own. There are not, not enough resources within myself, but you have the resources. It's not to the hand of others that I look. I look to your hand, oh God. So you make, you pray with petition, right? And with thanksgiving, which is an incredibly important part, with thanksgiving then, with gratitude in your heart, because you know, you, you're rejoicing in him, right? Let your requests or bring your askings to the Lord. Literally, your askings. Bring your, your requests, your askings be the Lord. Be specific with what you need. This is what I want. This is what I desire. This is where we are. What do you think about this, God? I look to you, right? But I'm, I'm laying down my anxiety and I'm trusting you I love this statement I just I picked it up kind of off of a music video this this week and it goes like this when God wants to make all things new we have to let go you have to let go in fact anxiety is is really it's just a, and turning your anxieties into prayers is about letting go right it's about letting go let go of your fear. Let go of your unbelief. Let go of your feelings of insignificance. It's about a lot. It's about letting go. Letting, let go of trying to control everything. Letting, let go of, uh, of, of that kind of religious spirit that can get a hold of us. That kind of says, well, I, you know, I know this stuff. You know. No, you say you know this stuff, but your life is filled with anxiety and fear and worry and controlling others and kind of like irritated at people. Just let go. Let go. 
When God wants to do something new and make all things new, we have to let go. And he says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Woo, I love that. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's, a wonder, it's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Amen? Amen. And not only that, we get to think new things. Whatever is, whatever is, is good and, and lovely and, you know, and is uh, praiseworthy and whatever is true, think about these things. This, this is the way. This, this, this is how you shift, right? Think on these things. It has to do again with that focus of your life. Think on these things. I want to wrap it up with these two other things rather quickly. Verses 11 through 13, in particular, the last part of 12 and then 13 says this. 11 says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I have learned the secret of being content in every any and every situation, I can do all things through him, meaning Christ, who gives me strength. That's pretty good, huh? It's in the Bible. I mean, if, even if you weren't to believe in the inspiration of the Bible, you would have to say, that's pretty good reading right there, right? Here it is. So, let's, just read it with me. Okay, in unison, right? From the top. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I love the word learned. I've learned. I kind of say I'm learning. I've been talking about slowing down, right? I want to tell you I am so happy this week because in the last week, I was 20% successful. But I'm trending. I'm trending. Are you trending? Out of anxiety and discontentment, irritation, bitterness. Are you trending into trust, faith, rest, joy, hope, and peace? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, man. You're just going to have to dig into that this week and see what God is trying to say to you in that. Apply your own life. Really? Really? Just don't, just don't worry about having learned it all. Just, just put, I am learning, and apply to yourself the truths that help you learn this. Right? A lot of repentance. A lot of, oh, my goodness, I was going to try to take a Sabbath day off. Try to take a day, you know, and just, you know, on Friday. And it was a disaster. It was a disaster. It was, I don't know. Anyway, you don't need to know more about my life. <laughs> you have your disaster days too, right? So here's the deal. I'm learning, but you can learn. You can actually learn by, by you know, turning your anxieties into prayers and thinking the things that are true and praiseworthy and lovely and beautiful and things that edify and build up and not all that other stuff that happens in your life. By gazing at Christ, by rejoicing in him, and then finally, this, this great piece right at the end, verse 19, he says this. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. He's been, and by the way, he's been talking about real material needs. Hey, Epaphroditus came, brought me your gifts. I'm, I'm amply supplied, probably with some food, maybe, you know, with some blankets, you know, maybe with some, a pen, maybe some, maybe some parchment so he could write, you know, uh, But, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you. But I will tell you what, my God, here's what I'm learning, will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, right? And let me me just like, let me just go back around before we turn this into a consumer verse. Your most basic need is that you were made by God, you were made for God, you were made to need God, you were made to run on God. God was meant to be your fuel. My God will supply all of your needs. 
and then all these other things. We can be satisfied only by the one who is infinite, eternal, and able to supply all of our needs. We are only at home in God because we were created for God. Right? Shift. Shift. So we're going to, about, I, I, I said to Chris, uh, he's going to lead us in a song, and uh, I'll tell you what I have up here. Okay? And I, it's nothing fancy, but it's more like, it's more like you saying, I'm going to do this. <laughs> right? Do you ever like, I'm going to do that. Right? So the one that's gripped to me, I'm going to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from my life. I'm trending. I'm at 20%, but I'm trending. So we've covered three things. The scarcity of love. There's not enough love. I don't have enough capacity. I'm like all, you know, I'm just like, and fear has a hold of your life or insignificance or unbelief. Just, But you know what? We learned that, that Christ loved us in the way that love is from God and he who loves has, has been born of God. And as God loved us in Christ, we are to love each other. So there's, there's, a, there's a sheet of paper up here on, on the inside, on the middle uh, bench up here. On the inside, it says, made for more love. There's enough love, and without those verses, you can come up. If you need help in loving people, uh, getting over the anxiety of like your your you know your uh, angst, your bitterness, your your struggle with people, just come and take that. Come and take that sheet. The middle one is about time. There's enough time, and it says there on this, made for more. There's enough time. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Learn from you, and you will find rest for your souls. Slow down. And then the next one is there are enough resources. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you, having everything that you need, will be able to abound in every good work because God just keeps supplying enough. The cycle of sufficiency, there's enough. There's enough. So wherever your struggle is, wherever, you're, wherever you need, the pinpoint shifting the focus from scarcity to abundance. As we sing, I just want to invite you to come. I don't care how hectic it is. Just come up, grab one of these if it speaks to you. And then we're just going to pray over us, okay? Let's stand together. Yeah, Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you. We rejoice in you because of your truth. We want to live gospeled lives we want to stay missionally available to you. We want to join with you in bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to others. How can we ever do that if we've been taken out by fear, anxiety, insignificance, unbelief? I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would find your way into all these places where we are harassed and bring us more and more into that abundance of life that you have offered to us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.